Y para la entrega del premio, por favor, presidente Sánchez, primer ministro Mario Draghi y presidente Faust. Mr. Draghi, please. Thank you very much. Well, I should say I'm quite moved by all this. I frankly didn't expect uh, uh, such uh, affection. Um, the words uh, all of you said before, I find frankly excessive. Um, I never had a sense that I was actually achieving so much. But thank you anyway. Um, dear President Sanchez, Ms. Secretary of State Artigas, President Faust, President Bonne, Cara Nadia, uh, Maria Gaia, uh, Jose Manuel, Caro Jose Manuel, well, thank you again. What I just said applies entirely to what you said. Um, just I'm blushing, so it's, you don't see it, but uh, it shows. Well, Professor Mas, thank you for your kind invitation today. I'm very grateful to receive the first ever prize for the European construction of the Circle d'Economia. As uh, President Faust reminded us, this event has its roots in the intuition of some young economists professors and businessmen from Barcelona who back in 1958 decided to found this circle. Such occasions provide a welcome opportunity to discuss openly and freely how to tackle the pressing economic and social issues of our times and how to continue on the path of European integration. The COVID-19 pandemic has dealt a devastating blow to our lives, our societies, our personal behaviors, and had uh, really depressing effects on our society. At least 3.8 million people have lost their lives, and a fifth of that was in Europe. Italy and Spain have been among the hardest hit countries with more than 200 deaths combined. The uncertainty from the pandemic as well as the measures adopted to contain it, have also taken a severe toll on the economy. Gross domestic product in the European Union fell by 6.1%, the largest contraction on record. Italy and Spain saw the sharpest reductions with a drop of 8.9 and 10.8 respectively. The development of a number of effective vaccines has set out a clear path out of this crisis. Across the European Union, we've launched ambitious vaccination campaigns that are succeeding in saving lives and reducing the pressure on our hospitals. Nearly one in two Europeans have received at least one dose of the vaccine, and one in four have been fully vaccinated. There have been 140,000 new cases across Europe across the European Union last week, 
down from more than one million only two months ago, which shows that we are much better. We aren't finished yet. The vaccination effort has also allowed us to reopen our economies. Growth is bouncing back. The European Commission forecasts that gross domestic product in the European Union will expand by 4.2% this year. But I think in Italy and Spain, the increase is projected to be 4.2 and 5.9, respectively. And I think, frankly, that these figures will be revised upward as confidence, and probably significantly upwards, as confidence returns among companies and families. I think policymakers across the world uh, should take and must take some credit for the speed of this upturn. Throughout the crisis, governments and central banks have put in place a forceful fiscal and monetary policy response to support the economy. I would say a, a, an unprecedentedly, unprecedented force response. I don't think I actually remember a fiscal response of this size since the, since the Second World War. Bank regulators have introduced low moratoria and suspended some of their prudential rules to prevent the risk of a credit crunch. Not only has this prompt policy reaction avoided an even deeper recession and safeguarded millions of jobs, it has also mitigated the risk of hysteresis and paved the way for a rapid economic recovery. But the protracted uncertainty means that the case for monetary and fiscal expansion still remains compelling. Our objective must be to bring economic activity back to at least the trajectory it had before the pandemic. Only then we will we be able to say that we have overcome the impact of the health crisis on our societies and on employment. At the moment, however, all projections suggest that we will not reach this objective without additional stimulus. So, we must act on it promptly and effectively. During the pandemic, we deployed significant resources to protect the productive capacity of our economies. Most of the fiscal expansion was aimed at keeping companies, and in, companies in business and people in employment. Most, having, sorry, having protected the supply side of our economies, we must now ensure that demand rise to meet those levels of supply. Ideally, we should aim at exceed the pre-pandemic growth trajectory. With higher levels of activity than before, we can compensate for the rise in debt that took place during the health crisis. We also need faster employment growth to create the new jobs that we need. And we shouldn't forget that the global economy is undergoing profound transformation, including the digital and the environmental transition that will require a, what I think is going to be a massive reallocation of jobs. Maintaining easy demand conditions is therefore essential to ensure that we support workers as they face an increasing risk of dislocation. The overall benign outlook hides a number of important risks. The pandemic appears increasingly under control, but as I said before, it's far from over. The vaccination effort has been largely limited to the rich world. Only 0.3% of total doses have been administered in low-income countries, while the richer ones have distributed 85% of the total. Not only is the difference ethically unfair, it's also dangerous. So long as the virus circulates freely, there is a risk of the emergency of emergence of new variants. 
one or more of them may be resistant to our vaccines and undermine the success of our campaigns. So we must continue to invest in research and accelerate our efforts to ensure widespread access to the vaccines. Supporting our scientists will also put us in a much better position when the next pandemic comes. After the second, the second risk or the third risk that we should uh, have in mind is uh, the following. After a long period of time when it was too low, and we can say that it was just too low, global, infa glo global inflation has picked up recently. The inflation rate across the OECD has hit 3.3% in April, up from 2.4 in March, and it's the highest rate since 2008. Most economists believe this is only a temporary effect due to a combination of pent-up demand, short-term supply bot bottlenecks, and some base accounting factors. In the Eurozone, however, the core inflation rate, the one that excludes energy, and others' volatile items has not moved much, though in the United States it has increased. So we must remain vigilant to the possibility that inflation expectations may shift in the future, and we must also monitor the risk of divergence between the Eurozone and the U.S. economy, and what this would entail for the stance of the respective central banks. The behavior of the monetary authorities is especially relevant given the high level of debt across the world. In the European Union, the debt to GDP ratio rose by 16.7 percentage points in 2020. In Spain, it jumped by over 25 percentage points and in Italy by 15.8 percentage points. Moreover, governments have offered generous guarantees to companies. At the end of 2020, they amounted to nearly 450 billion euros for the four largest European Union countries alone. In the event of bankruptcies, these guarantees could entail an even higher sovereign debt in the future. Companies have also increased their borrowing significantly between the last quarter of 2019 and that of 2020, the ratio between debt and equity for the largest non-financial firms in Europe increased from 220% to 250%. An expansionary fiscal policy, as I said before, remains essential to preserve growth. In turn, this allow, will allow to reduce the debt burden both private and public. However, we must also reassure investors that we will return to fiscal prudence as soon as the recovery is self-sustained. That is our benchmark. This is why our emphasis now is on non-recurrent fiscal spending and why we need to concentrate it increasingly where the effects on growth are higher. We say where the multipliers are higher. A long-term anchor will help to keep interest rates low and allow governments to continue to boost investment. Finally, we must ensure, and that's the other risk that we don't want to run again, we must ensure that this recovery is both equitable and sustainable. In uh, the recent past, and even in the past not so recent, uh, we somehow forgot the importance of social cohesion. After the European debt crisis, the number of people at risk of poverty or social exclusion in the European Union grew by around 3.5 million and hasn't yet returned to its pre-crisis level. We took democracy for granted and ignored the risk of populism. 
As our societies go through significant economic changes, we must accompany workers with active labor policies. This means opening up new opportunities for, the women, for women and the young and retraining and reskilling all those who have lost their jobs. At the same time, we must ensure that during this upturn, we pay greater attention to climate. We can't leave this health crisis only to sleepwalk into an environmental crisis. Now, we all refer, I heard it many, being said many, many times, uh, to Jean Monnet, who wrote, Europe will be made through crisis, and it will be the sum of the solutions brought to these crises. I mean, if I think, if you think, well, it's a kind of strange sentence, and I'm not sure I fully understand it even, but, but then when I, when I doubt it, and then I look at ourselves after all we've gone through, and we're still together, then it must be true. A, a, successful, a successful recovery from the pandemic requires coordination, especially within the Eurozone. We must continue to strengthen our institutions and foster mutual trust, and stand united as Europeans to fight the defining challenges of our times, climate change and inequalities. For decades, the rest of the world has looked at Europe for its unique combination of fairness and prosperity. This is and should remain our pride. Thank you. Gracias, primer ministro Draghi. Eh, el primer ministro Draghi, el presidente Sánchez y el presidente Faust van a salir a hacerse una fotografía institucional y en unos instantes regresarán. Así que si por favor son tan amables de, de sentarse con nosotros porque van a tener tiempo de saludarles y de estar con, con ellos en unos instantes. Muchas gracias. Bueno, y con, si son tan amables de, de escucharme, por favor, unos instantes hasta que vuelvan los, los presidentes. Con este acto llegamos al final de esta 36 edición del Cercla de Economía. Recuerden ustedes que hay un almuerzo en la terraza SALT. Quisiera dar las gracias a todos aquellos que han venido aquí de forma presencial y a todos aquellos que nos están siguiendo de forma online. Ha sido tres días muy intensos con un montón de conversaciones abiertas y sobre todo titulares que no vamos a olvidar. Queremos dar las gracias también a todos los patrocinadores del CERCLA y de esta edición y que les han acompañado durante todo el año de pandemia. Gracias por haber estado ahí. A todos, mucha suerte y hasta el año que viene. Buenas tardes.